you know, living day to day and the whole world is, is easy and open. And then somebody comes to you and says, Hey, uh, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? You know, and you actually have to think about it because there's a deadline looming of, you know, college or, you know, whatever. In my case, um, my, my father, um, was a mechanic. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Way Podcast with your host, Sajid Merwar. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Mark Roberts, a VP, a VP Creative Director at Glenn Davis. And yeah, we're just going to be talking about talking about him and his career and everything he's um, kind of done. And yeah, why don't we just get a quick introduction from yourself, Mark? Well, yeah, thanks for having me, Sajid. Um yeah, I, uh, you know, it sounds a little big when you say it that way, but, um, really it's, it's just been a, a journey, right? Um, I am, uh, indeed a creative director at, um, uh, the Davis agency, which is, um, part of a bigger group, uh, called Glenn Davis group. Um, and so I'm one of uh, a few creative directors there. Um, I basically, you know, started my career, uh, you know, straight out of high school, I guess, um, as, you know, going into the design profession and became a, you know, a, a graphic designer, uh, kind of grew over the years. And, um, you know, I can get into a little bit of that story a little bit later, but basically, you know, that's what's taken me to, you know, this, this part of my career and i mean you know we met at uh at a uh, uh seminar i guess where i was you know i thought i was blathering about <laughs> how i got into what i was doing but it seemed to strike a chord with you so i was uh was happy to come on and and talk a little bit more about that yeah of course it's always um you know, when you were you came to Professor Blackburn's class, um, it's just really refreshing and uh, reassuring to hear that, you know, somebody who's uh, going to graduate in a few months, you know, looking for jobs, trying to figure out what's going on with their life at this at this point. It's nice to know that. I mean, you hear it from people that, you know, people just figure stuff out as they go along. A lot of times they sure. have their general plan, sure, but the stuff in between, you don't really know. And it's nice to hear that from your own personal experience, like you've had a journey leading up to where you are now uh, that may not be very, um, not as predictive <laughs> as you would have thought if you just right. looked at the first place you started. So wh why right. don't we get into a bit of that? How did you, you said you started out as a graphic designer. How did that um, pan out for your the rest of your career? Yeah, I, I mean, what happened was... Um, you know, when you're in high school and you're you're kind of self-involved and you just like, you know, living day to day and the, the whole world is is easy and open. And then somebody comes to you and says, hey, uh, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? You know, and you actually have to think about it because there's a deadline looming of, you know, college or, you know, whatever. In my case, um, my, my father um, was a mechanic and he owned his own um, uh, uh, auto repair shop so and I love cars and, and fixing cars so I was just under the assumption that's what I'm doing uh, I, I didn't tell anyone I didn't talk to my parents about it or anything I just was like yeah I was at the shop all the time I was fixing and doing stuff so I just assumed everyone knew that's what I was going to do and then my parents came to me near uh, the end of high school and said where are you going to go to college and I'm like I'm not I'm going to just go into the to the business and they said well no you you have to at least at the very least take um you know, take a, a year uh at a college somewhere so i'm like i'm freaking out like not even part of my plan up to this point yeah like not worried about grades not doing anything right so um you know university was out of the question for me but um you know, I went into the, the guidance counselor's office then because, like, you know, everything's physical there and you're going in and there's like 
pamphlets in a in a hold like here's all the things you can do and um i just by chance kind of met uh, a friend of mine in there and he was doing the same thing and i'm like what are you what are you doing and he said oh, i'm gonna go and I'm, I'm gonna do this graphic design thing and i'm i'm like what's that like I, I literally didn't know what it was like to me it was just an art class right there was no like i come from a small town so there's no graphic design per se and so he kind of told me about it um up until then when he explained it to me i thought well that what is that making signage like like that's literally how little i knew um and he says yeah that's i think that's what it is he didn't know either right? <laughs> so i hitched a ride with him and his family to uh you know a college and happened to be uh, conestoga and that kind of was a pivotal you know uh, journey for me like i went there and i'm like wow i, I didn't know like you, you're telling me i can make money doing this because mm -hmm. i was you know i was i always drew uh, you know I, I i wouldn't say i was an artist by any sense but i liked you know creating things uh sketching things like that so um that was a, that was a big big deal so like at that point though i'm like okay this i can do for a year like that's still my requirement so i'm going to still go and you know be a, a mechanic or something of that nature after um so i go in and like there's a whole process where you gotta apply and show a portfolio which i never had i had to scramble and i'm like showing up to this in my world like kitchener was a big city at that point mm -hmm. and uh i'm like here's my sketches that i'm pulling out of a manila envelope and everybody around me's got these big portfolio cases and they're looking so professional and i'm like I'm just like, I'm so, you know, out of it right here. Um, but for some reason, I, like the guys, the, the professors that looked at my stuff happened to like cars too, because that's what all my sketches were, right? They're cars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so somehow I, I made it in, um, did that um, for one year. And I, I, I thought about quitting like almost weekly. I'm like, this is, I, I'm over my head. I don't think I can do it. But I just managed to keep going because, you know, I made this promise that I'm going to do it. Well, by the end of that year, I had gotten really good at, you know, the technical parts of um, design. Um, and so, you know, that last, you know, couple months of, of the first year was, I said, okay, I'm going to do one more year. You know, still thinking I'm going to be... Um, me going back to being a mechanic, but I'm going to do one more year. Well, keep going another year, did, did, and then finally did the third year. From from that, I I just thought, okay, let me let me just try and see if I can make money at this. Hmm. And so yeah. I, I took the first job that came through. It was for like a real estate company doing brochures and things like like that, and I. Um, you know, the, the, the thing with that was um, through all of my time in college, this was at this really pivotal um, time where computers were just kind of coming in, right? So my first year, no computers. Second year, we had a little Mac SE that was locked in a room that you had to sign out and use it. And you really couldn't do much on it. But And it was this thing where everyone's like, oh, the computer. Hmm. And then... You know, by the by the third year, we had a couple more, but nobody really knew how to use them at that point. So that first job, even though it was boring to me, uh, I was making money and they had a computer, a computer that I could sit on and I could learn stuff like every day. So to me, I was consciously um, saying, OK, I don't love it, but I'm learning something. And that's kind of. I always think about any situation I'm in is like, what am I getting out of it? So that to me, that first job, which I lasted about a year there, but I completely taught myself how to use the Mac in that year. So, uh, I got let go. Like it wasn't, you know, I wasn't, uh, um, but I had built up some freelance clients and things like that. And I worked at a deal where I could buy that computer when I left. So then I worked freelance for a couple of years, got into um, uh, 
you know, a small design agency in Mississauga that I, I think I was basically hired in retrospect to be their IT person. You know, I thought I was coming to be a designer, but they were like, okay, you got to buy us a computer and you got to set it up and you got to learn how to use the modem <laughs> and you got to like do all that kind of stuff. Right. So, but I'm, I don't care. Like, I'm like, I'm learning stuff. I'm in a, I'm in a, an agency at this point. So I'm like, that's cool. Um, and so, you know, I'm learning things like that's basically been the premise for everything that I've done is I got to be getting something out of this. And so, when I stopped getting something out of it. So three years into that agency, I felt like I'm working way too much. I'm working too hard. I'm not getting, you know, compensated the way I feel I should. So I started looking and for another, for another gig. And I, again, no internet at this point. So I'm like looking through magazines, like uh, marketing magazines, things like that. And I see this ad for Davis. And they're looking for a an intermediate designer. Well, at this point, I wouldn't classify myself as that. I'd be like a junior designer probably. But I thought, hey, I'm just going to call and see if they have a message on them, you know, on their answering service or whatever about it. So I call and Glenn Davis, the owner of the company, picks up. This is like 10 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like freaked out because I'm terrible on the phone. I can't like... I'm nervous. I'm anxious about everything. Um, but he was so easy to talk to and we, we chatted and, um, you know, it, it just kind of went from there. I went to an interview, chatted with him, felt good. And so I, I went there and that was, it'll be 30 years that I've been at Davis, um, in April. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the journey to where I'm at. Like there's a little bit more about that. I'd like to say probably about why I've stayed there. Um, and because a lot of people would coin, you know, they coin you as a lifer or like, Oh, you're not you know pushing or, you know, whatever, like yeah. I'm growing. And I think that the answer to that is, well, you know, if things happened at the right times, within Davis, like it it happened to be growing at the same pace that I was growing. So Mm -hmm. anytime I felt stagnant, they'd hire a new person that was extremely uh, interesting or exciting. And I'd learned from them or, you know, we take on a new discipline. Like we started out as we were just a packaging design company and now we've become an integrated agency. So every time I was like getting the itch to move or do something, it's like, well, a new challenge would come up, whether it be our company, whether it would be the industry, like, Hey, the internet comes along in like 96 and it's like opens everything up. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, we hire some people that, that really get us into strategy work. And then the last say 10 years we've gotten into social media and digital work and motion and so there's always something that equally scares the crap out of me and keeps me there and interested right so now enter like ai and everything that that's doing it's like you you just constantly have to be learning and growing Mm -hmm. and I've, i've gotten all that from from my time at davis so um yeah so that's the journey uh, in a nutshell, well, not really a nutshell. Like felt like I talked way too long on that. <laughs> That's why we're here. We're here to hear your okay. you know, experience. But yeah, it's it's really interesting to hear that. So often, they people say, but especially our generation, that we're more likely to switch jobs in the first mm-hmm. or second year uh, of working at a place. But, you know, this made me think of the reason why that happens. Maybe most firms or most companies are not as as innovative or as constantly changing as your you had a, your experience at, uh, at Davis. Mm-hmm. And I think what people seek, this is just from my, my personal opinion, but people sure. seek that same kind of, even if they're not actively looking for it, that same level of... Um, learning something new, new experiences, new challenges, because, you know, some people, people at the end of the day, 
want security in their jobs as well and they want mm -hmm. um they want to know that there's there's money coming into their account and stuff which is very understandable but even people who i've seen who like who talk about that they say like they're burnt out after a few years working you know working at an ib or in uh, mm -hmm. some other really um really intense field especially for people starting out um and then they they end up switching careers anyway you know mm -hmm. but i think i think there's a give and take with that it's funny you hear all these people who are hyper successful and um have have achieved so much in terms of uh, monetary success they always say you know prioritize your health and work-life balance in the beginning but it's ironic because you know if you look at their careers <laughs> they, did, they didn't they mm didn't -hmm. they had to do all the the grunt work and they had sure. to grind it out and it's only when you look back that you know what i had yeah. to do that to get to this point um and i think that you know i i would appreciate i appreciate that even you mentioned yourself like you had to work at somewhere where you didn't like for for a while to learn how to actually work on the job and learn yeah. the key things and i think there's just i think uh people around my age and or just people in general often want things too quick um and yeah i mean it's it's, it's tough for yeah tough for me to to say things like that because i'm not you know i don't want to be the you know the grumpy old guy that says ah you guys just this and that like i <clears throat> i mean i i i agree in some cases that um people you know want things too quick like i was one of those people like part of the my journey was like going to glenn and saying i I'm, i gotta get out because we're not you know doing this right and you know whatever and he was a calming influence so just just you know give it six months you know so he's in the background trying to make small changes and and i'm like he's calming me down to just buy a little bit of time but i think the whole thing comes down to you have to be getting something out of it that isn't money all the time uh it's experience like i really you know and i i've i've done all the cliches like i work too hard and i you know haven't had the good you know work-life balance and a lot of times that manifests itself in just sheer anxiety right like you, you, I don't know if it's work-life balance or just taking care of yourself and understanding um, what's physically possible even. But um, I have a good kind of view of it because my daughter, who has also just joined um, uh, Davis as a designer, um, you know, I tried to steer her away from it, but it, it <laughs> she mm -hmm. she loves it and she's getting um, a lot of uh, joy out of it but I see that I see like the desire to do things quickly and I need to do this and I need to do that and I'm like you know you're 25 years old like you got a ton of time and so mm -hmm. I'm telling her things like this you have to um, you know have that balance give it time learn things um, you, you know anything that gives you a little bit of knowledge helps you in the end so but of course we all got to live right? you got to have the money too so i think why a lot of young people would move within um jobs and and again that was a common thing for even creative people it's like you don't stay at a place more than three years yeah and then you have to move and i just every time that kind of feeling came up and it was around three to four years something changed that said oh i want to be able to i don't know if it was like a competitive thing i want to be able to learn that i want to be able to win at that or whatever but i could do it from the safety of having a a, a paid job yeah so at the beginning of your career you're not getting paid as much right so that's you know at my stage it's like that's a that's a big kind of reason to um stay right like i've got the security i've got the the safety and i think a lot of um great things can be done, done when a person feels safe to explore to push you know to make mistakes to fail and not you know be kind of 
you know, centered out for it. And I think that's one of the things that I really had um, driven or strived to achieve in my own life, but also for everybody that works with me is like, I, I mean, I probably failed like four times this morning. Like, it's just, you're making decisions, you're trying things you have, as long as you have a reason for your decision, it's cool. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I see that behavior that you spoke of. It's not, it's not a negative in my opinion. It's just, it is what it is. It's people. And, and guess what? Like that first job wasn't for me. I knew that, but I stayed at it because I was, you know, getting something out of it, but mm -hmm. there's no, no sense staying at a job where you just don't dig it. And I'll, yeah, I'll talk to junior designers that work for me and go, look, we're a big company. You're not getting great jobs because there's so many senior designers above you. You would be better off if you went to a smaller company. You would be the, the, the hero there, whatever. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't want to monopolize or hurt people's lives for the sake of the company. Like everybody's, yeah. you know, got got a spot where they can shine so like let's let's find it let's figure it out so yeah it's um it's something i, I i've been thinking about a lot just because i'm kind of in that position like the crossroads right now mm -hmm. um in the process of in this you know insane job market <laughs> right now um just looking it's 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 funny because in, in the beginning i kind of had that idea of like you know i want to really apply to places and do things that give me the opportunity for that but you know sometimes at this point um you're kind of like i'll take anything and i'll figure it out you know <laughs> i feel like that's mm -hmm. where a lot of people or at least just speaking for myself that's where where i'm at right now um and i think that like worst case you know if i have a job that pays it's not bad to have a job that pays decent money and i can support because i have other things thankfully some people don't you know mm -hmm. they don't have other things to really support themselves creatively and you know there's i've i've heard this talked about um quite a bit in terms of like the habits people have you hear all these like these gurus say this you know but i try to apply like what i think is what makes sense from that is having things that support um, or hobbies or ways in life that support different aspects, something that feeds your soul, that, that helps your mm -hmm. body, helps your mind. And I have those things. Um, so mm -hmm. what I do during the day doesn't matter as much right now. Um, because, you know, I like I like the field that I want to go into anyway. I love marketing as a field. Mm -hmm. Strategy is super interesting to me. Um, it's uh, I have things like the podcast um, mm -hmm. I'm working on. Uh, Is that like your passion thing? Like you, you're also a martial artist. You're... Yeah, mar martial arts is less of like a hobby. It's almost like it sounds cheesy, but it's kind of like I just don't I just can't not do it. You know, it's like, right, right, right. OK, yeah, it's like brushing my teeth. You know, every day mm -hmm. I'm like I'm like the maniac who's in line <laughs> shadow boxing, you know, because I've been doing it for so long. <laughs> almost, it's been almost half my life now. I've been doing it. Okay. So it's 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 basically a part of my day. And same thing with music. Like I've been doing music for the okay. same amount of time, um, playing piano, and I've started making music the last uh, three four years. So it's been something that the music really feeds my soul for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a way to express yourself and really understand without even saying anything learn more about yourself without even saying anything it's hard to describe unless you really experience it yourself like one thing i enjoy music more as a musician of course more enjoy different types of music but really playing it connecting yourself to it it's it's not just like a it's hard to describe to be honest it's just um, well the way i take that kind of statement too that like i think you're going to be okay because you get so many kind of diverse interests that's going to keep you um you know well-rounded it also it also like it's because if i relate it to myself um you know people tell you hey do what you love 
like, and you'll never work a day, you're like that kind of thing. That's kind of true, but I've never, like, design was never my passion. It was cars. It was like, you know, taking something and fixing it. And it was, you know, I didn't know any of this at the time, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, hey, I'm getting paid decent money to do this. And it seems relatively easy and I'm learning things. And it's like, but I would never have said that this is my passion. This, you know, I would, you know, I, I, will, well, I play hockey. That's something I do on the side. I, um, you know, my daughter and I fixed up an old pickup truck. Like there, there's so many outside interests. I like construction. I like building furniture. All that. I've got so many other things that I would consider much more uh, passion, but those things, like you said, music, um, the martial arts, uh, all of those things, they, they really start to help you become um, much more robust in your, your daily life too. Like there's so many inferences of um, the way that I behave with the team in hockey transfers over to make me hopefully a better leader with um, people. So it's that well-roundedness that just is going to give you so much more depth in whatever job you land, career, you know, you end up in. But again, this is all goes back to just, um, you know, you're learning something at every point and that means you're getting something out of the interaction with the situation. As long as you keep doing that, no matter what you do, you're going to, you're going to excel. Right. So it's no problem to take a job that you don't think is going to work out because you're going to get something out of it. You, you're going to be able to practice certain things there um, and then move on if it's not right. I mean, it sounds easy on paper because everything's up in the air for when, you know, when you're at that level, but you know, and, and I just, I did a portfolio review with, the, with, you know, with the college, um, that I came from yesterday. And I, so I talked to seven, you know, designers that are trying to get, you know, out into the world. And I'm like, these kids are so slick and good and um, articulate. I'm like, I think about myself back then. I'm like, I didn't like talking on the phone. I was, I was just anxious. I, I just, I'm like, I can't even believe I got a job at some point. <laughs> so like, it's, you know, nobody expects you to be out of the gate, you know, superstar. So, you know, I just tell her, I told half the people on that call, just calm down. Like, it's, it's okay. I can, you know, I've been there, I've done, you know, gone through what you're going through. Just talk to me, tell me a story. You know, why, you, you know, why'd you do this project? Why'd you do that? So it's just, I wish I could go back and tell myself, to relax a little bit. Yeah. Um, one of the things too, I was like checking out what you were talking about, um, about the way and, and this learning from others so that you can, um, you know, define the, the way you want to be yourself. So I think I really subscribe to that kind of issue. Like I've, I, I would make an addendum to that and say like, you know, it's, it's tricky because you don't want to get into this mode of comparison, right? Like you don't want to be emulating people mm -hmm. um, and believing that their way is better. But I do agree that like, you have to watch everyone, everything, understand it. You know, why are they doing that? Why are they doing it that way versus this way? But it also has to come with um, confidence that, that your way could possibly be the right way or better way or the way that you would do it. Mm -hmm. So I really like, you know, this observation uh, mentality of like, yeah, just be super inquisitive about, you know, why is Mark doing it that way? Yeah. Oh, that doesn't really fit with me. But I think what he was trying to do was this, like, and that's a hundred percent. I wish I would have known that earlier because I went through, a lot of years where I was trying to be other people like, Oh, that person can really talk to the client well 
and he does this and he does that and I, I and I tried to be it and I was just disingenuous I was I was copying versus understanding what they were doing and then doing it in my own way and it wasn't until I you know started just going I can't I, can't, I was frustrated I can't do this I don't feel good about myself and I finally just went like man maybe my way isn't that bad like maybe I can just be a little bit more um human like you know when you come from a small town and you feel like you're not worthy and you're anxious because like all these you know uh, big city people are you know they got it all down it's like that anxiety just stifles you and you have to pretend to be something you're not well the moment i stopped and just said i am what i am yeah take it or leave it shit started happening it was it, it was freeing i got more um successful um i still get super super anxious but i like this podcast I, i'm like i don't who wants to hear what i gotta say <laughs> so but you you just push yourself and go you know i'm gonna try it to see mm-hmm. Same what I met with uh, Inez, in, you know, in, in your class. Same thing. I'm not a huge fan of public speaking, but it's a whole lot easier when you can just be yourself. Yeah. And you're not trying to emulate people, right? Yeah, 100%. I can totally agree with that. And I know it, might, it may not seem like it right now, but I'm totally that person who was super anxious growing up, like, like not ordering any at a restaurant. Uh, until I was like, I don't know, in middle school, high school. Um, Mm -hmm. I was able to make friends growing up, but it wasn't like I was very outgoing and talking to a bunch of people all the time, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. It wasn't really until, like martial arts really gave me that assurance in myself that, you Mm -hmm. know, I can, why am I, you know, like, what's the worst that could happen talking to another person <laughs> that you don't know mm-hmm. or just striking up a conversation? Yeah. Um, like, if I show this podcast to my, myself, like, beginning of high school, I would probably be shocked that I'm doing talking to people that sure. I've met once before, you know? Yeah. And it's uh, it's something that it took a, a while to kind of get into that mode. And I feel like I've that whole pushing yourself outside of your, your comfort zone is really important, especially when it comes to, you know, obviously in certain scenarios, it might be like, um, like in scenarios like this, where it's just interacting with people. I always, I've never had an experience where it's, I've, I've come out of it without something to gain. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the way or my reasoning that pushed me forward to do stuff like this, like contacting people, like even just this year or last year, because of the whole uh, the whole pandemic in the first two years mm-hmm. i basically um it was really difficult to like talk to new people especially going from high school to uni and mm. it was more like this like beginning of third year when i really had that kind of um outgoing kind of uh, nature which is totally against <laughs> who i am but kind of just saying screw it and you know might as well might as well do that like just I've never been one to strike up random conversations with people outside or like. Do you think, uh, Sajin, that that's, is there any acting that happened there? Like, did you like just say, I'm going to try this. I'm going to, you know, kind of, I don't know what the word is, but take yourself out of your own kind of head and just say, oh, what would this person do? Because that's really what got me started is like, you know, I'm going to try and do it this way. And I'm almost going to put on this facade and I'm like, Hey, that didn't go too bad. Or, and then I'm just now going to not uh, do this part anymore. Cause that didn't seem good. like I'm constantly self-assessing yeah, yeah, um, exactly. my interactions and stuff. So, but it started with like, honestly, I'm like, and everybody in, in the company is like, like, uh, Oh, you're so good at public speaking. I'm like, I, I would, I would love to never have to speak publicly again. Like, I can't stand it. Yeah. 
I get so anxious and nervous and I just have to take myself out and pretend like I'm, I'm acting and, and, you know, um, now it gets easier when you, the older you get, but I mean, I'm like, man, I wish I would have learned this a long, long time ago that the more you, you act it out, the more it becomes easy to do. And then it becomes part of who you are versus, so, so I'm not acting anymore. It's just, it, it was a way to get me kickstarted. I think, yeah. does, does that happen with you at all? Or is that? Oh yeah. It's, <laughs> that's the only way I could uh, ever do something like this. Like, it's funny. I liken it to like everything to martial art on this podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. you know, in, in martial art, especially when you're you're you know having an altercation with another person like you're you're sparring you're having a fight you have to fake the funk a lot you know because you have to have sure. a poker face you can't show them that you're hurt from whatever you can't show them that you're tired but you also have to like before you can develop your own style you're just imitating people right sure and seeing what works and then this kind of hodgepodge um Frankenstein style that you form becomes your own later. And I think that it's okay mm -hmm. because I used to be like, you know, why am I trying to be somebody else? You know, like I wasn't necessarily emulating a person, but just a way people speak or, um, mm -hmm. because I was, um, you know, I loved, uh, uh, like doing accents and like the stupid characters growing mm -hmm. up. Um, and I did, uh, I did drama in high school and I was in a few plays but it, that was way easier than talking to a person one on one because you can't see really? the crowd. You, <laughs> it's because you can put on because the whole point is putting on the character, right? You know they can't judge yeah. you if you're Demetrius from Midsummer Night's Dream. You know, like sure, okay. Um, and it was so funny because on there's there's something that happened to me in in uh, in high school that really changed. Like I had like a a really like a second lease on life. And mm -hmm. that really changed my perspective. Like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to do everything. Like, I don't care. Mm. Even if I really fuck it up, um, I don't. I, as long as I tried it, I don't care. Because, like, I could have never been. I, I might not have ever got that chance. It might have been over, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, like, kind of put in perspective. Like, at the time, I wasn't really. It was kind of weird. At the, It was like a, a health scare, you know. And it was something that I never. In the moment, I wasn't scared. You know, one of the most surreal things I've mm. ever experienced when I'm waiting for the results of like a test that could be like, it could tell me like I have X amount of time to live or I'm completely yeah. fine, right? And in that, those 20 minutes in the in the waiting room at Mount Sinai, <laughs> uh, I mm. I literally contemplated my entire life up until that point. And I remember being so at peace it was it was really insane because obviously my parents are holding it in right they're stressed not trying to show mm -hmm. me anything right and yeah. then once we got the confirmation that you know everything's fine um they let all their emotions come out and it was so it's only in retrospect that i realized like that was such a pivotal moment for me mm -hmm. because it could have been over like my life could have been over um i just got i just got lucky you know, that it was just, uh, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't. So at that point is when I really started to like, you know what, let me just try. I'm going to try. I see this person doing this. Let me try doing it like that. You know, that's why I was in those plays. Like I liked drama, but I was never in a play before that year. And that year I was yeah. in, I was in three plays, you know, and I just tried out for them and just went for it. And, um, you know, I started really focusing on my, like trying out music, um, in 12th grade i tried to i started uh co-founded like a, a small drama association try to raise money for a play um same thing with the podcast like there's all these different things that stemmed from that one moment and it all started out with me just pretending like i i knew what i was doing <laughs> and then eventually i kind of <laughs> figured this figured it out a little yeah. bit you know um like even for the podcast i was just emulating the other people i've listened to sure. and the structure of yeah. people i've listened to since i was you know 14 years old so it was right. um it, it's nice to hear that you know that makes that's like a good approach you know <laughs> it actually works yeah. in the end well i i mean it, it's i think it's literally the only way to, to do it i mean whether you acknowledge it or not like everybody's probably doing the same thing right like just um 
but but my you know what I'm so I'm trying to teach um, designers who are trying to you know become design directors or design directors that are trying to become creative directors and and now I'm realizing hey they're looking at me and trying to do what I do and I'm like okay here's fundamentally what I'm doing but you got to find your own voice like yeah. you you trying to do it my way like it's not going to work like um, you have a whole different set of uh, values and experiences and what that made you you um, so just that's literally what we try and do is, is you know find what's comfortable for them while they're delivering a message that is clear and simple and you know followable kind of thing so um, you know I, I I haven't I haven't been in listening to podcasts that long but the thing I love about the ones I love is that I just I get reassurance because people say things and I'm like I feel that way mm -hmm. yes like it just gives me confidence because I find a lot of times um, professional individuals don't talk like we are right now like yeah I, I mean I'm trying to be as open as possible with my colleagues but you don't get that all the time you, you know there's this this wall of you have to pretend like you've got everything figured out mm -hmm. and you know um one of the things that, that that i appreciate that glenn um glenn taught me was you know it's okay to say you don't know but i'm gonna find out like there's much more power in that statement than <clears> there <throat> is trying to bullshit your way through something right yeah because that that'll always be found out um and so there's you know, there's things like that where that just taught me to be more open, be more, um, you know, human about the fact that, man, I don't know, this could be wrong, completely wrong, but I'm going to do it this way. And here's why I'm going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And then I look around the room and I, everybody's like, that seems legit. Let's do that. Like I'm skating on 50% accuracy here. And, uh, and people are like on board. Okay it just tells me that everybody's unsure about everything and you know we're all just trying to get through this together yeah honestly especially when looking at the whole like design like user design business like the, just the general business design field i was really exposed to it in my in my last year now um and i just when we worked on a project with uh tim's financial for one of our courses it was such such an eye opener on the design process and something that I really liked because as somebody who comes from, you know, a so-called creative lens uh, as a musician, um, it's, it's likened to, to that where you kind of just, you're doing your research, you're trying stuff. Cause like you can only watch so many videos on how to use a digital audio workspace, but there's only one way to actually, learn you have to just do it and try stuff like mm -hmm. yeah and you're gonna end up doing like i remember learning that you can quantize something which is just automatically make it in time rather than have to play directly on the metronome directly on time every single time which saved me so much time later but then you know <laughs> you don't nobody tells you that right because these people who yeah. are teaching you they're like oh it makes sense you just quantize the beat you know but it's uh it's there's so many things like that like with I remember for our project, we went through so many rounds of interviews trying to figure out how do we get people to use this this card. And then everyone came up with different solutions in the end. But it was, um, it was a really fun process. And I really enjoyed how it was 95% what the hell is the problem rather than what the solution is. Because, yeah. you know, in commerce, you're so focused on the kind of predictive approach rather than like an iterative uh, where you just hammer out try to hammer out the problem rather than to find the most general problem and make a foolproof solution you know mm -hmm. um so it's, it was really refreshing um obviously there's logistical things when it comes to i remember we i had a we read a case about a consulting uh I, I think it was actually mckinsey was merging with uh a business design in that case a business design firm and they're like how do we merge the almost a opposite processes where one is focused mm -hmm. on to find the solution as quick as possible to work on the the solution 
or to find the problem as, uh, as soon as possible. And the other one's the opposite. Um, it's just, it, it shows you that there's so many different ways to do things. But I mean, I personally find that whole iterative process so enjoyable in the end, of course. Obviously, when you're in the middle mm-hmm. of it, it's kind of like, what what the hell is going on? You know, like, what do these people want? Yeah. How are we going to get them to use this product? Um, and I think that it's nice to know that, like, that actually applies outside of, you know, just the classroom where it's encouraged to be, yeah. uh, to try stuff and not have it not work out. Um, obviously not everywhere, but certain places, like your experience at, uh, at Davis, um, it seems like you had that, at least some level of experience where you're able to kind of just try stuff and, you know, figure it out. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a business with, with like a hundred and I don't know how many people we have, 120 distinct individuals. Right. So you, you know, you're dealing with all of these different um, people. And, and just to touch on what you were saying, like about defining, um, the problem versus, you know, just going to the solution. In our world, that would be something akin to a client coming to you with a brief and saying, here's what we need you to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been in enough situations where I've done exactly what they wanted and they're not happy. And that really told me, okay, well, you just didn't, you know, because I'm egotistical, it couldn't be my fault. So I go back and say, uh, so we haven't defined the actual problem then. Yeah. And that that is difficult and it's a constant and ongoing struggle for us because, you know, your you know, client or, or your internal people have done all of this work at compiling information and they hand it over to you and it's a big stack of data and things and you know, our job is to, you know, to simplify it down to like one or two really easy things, because what you're asking is take all of that data and turn it into something visual and emotional. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and if you don't have that, that problem or challenge well-defined, then it's doomed to fail. Right. Like you, you know, and, constantly trying to convince people that you know um in any piece of communication you can only do maximum three things like maximum really it's two it's like you know and so you have to be very very uh strategic about how you approach it knowing that you know you you will have other avenues to tell a fuller story but you have to really drive to simplicity yeah and so where that becomes you know, my current biggest issue is how do I teach a junior design person um, to question authority? Basically, that's what I'm asking. So if yeah. you're getting a brief, like I was there, you know, when I was young, all you want to do is please. Okay, you're asking me to do this, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it fast, I'm going to do it great. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying, okay, listen, listen to them and then step back and decide, do you agree with them? Like it, you got to practice using your own judgment to say, Hey, I know you think you need this, but really what I think the problem is this. And so we should do this mm-hmm. because if I'm in the room, then I can do that and help them. The problem that we generally have is when something's considered a small job, um, we don't generally have people that think that way in the room. So it becomes very transactional. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, we get into problems because those jobs, because they're small, don't get charged out as at a higher, you know, high enough rate. So you're, everyone's trying to do it quickly. Yeah. And if we would just define that problem a little bit quicker and say, I think this is what we need to do. You can still be efficient and solve the problem. Um, but I mean, that's something that I'm trying to teach and train without uh, making that designer seem like they're argumentative, seem like they're just trying to challenge authority. Like, yeah. It's a difficult kind of thing to get through, but 
uh, I think it's really, really important um, for everyone to listen and then decide if if what they're being told is is true, is half true, is uh, can need a little bit of adjustment. It's not like I disagree with everything everyone says, but I just need to make up my own mind because then when I give you what I think you need, I will have reasons to to support it, to be to to be behind it. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's all a big game, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it's um, no. When as you're talking about it, I think we we kind of touched this point before, but just it's something that my my martial arts instructor always said make observation not judgment and mm-hmm. you know the difference is one is an emotional reaction to the current scenario but an observation is almost taking a bird's eye view and trying to judge it impartially and look at how else you could have responded to that and he meant it in the context of uh, an exchange right like mm-hmm. don't just if somebody kicks you in the leg don't just kick him right back like that's it's so funny how the human brain works in those kind of scenarios because it's so it's it's the simplest interaction between two human beings you know who hitting one (laughs) hitting one another (laughs) Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty straightforward how a lot of things go and it's a really good metaphor for how 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 to view life and it might seem like counterintuitive that a physical altercation can be a metaphor for for life but when it's in that sportive kind of um, learning um, environment it really is um, my instructor always likened um, an exchange or a sparring session to a conversation um, and you know understanding that you know it's okay he all he also was never he taught us the fundamentals right he was very strict on on that level but once we had learned the fundamentals he always let us gave us chance to grow and find our own style and that's kind of i believe what you're trying to do right you give him the fundamentals mm-hmm. of how you think you know things should be done but you you tell them that you know you still have your own voice like it's important for you to make your own path and go your own way with it. And, you know, I learned that first in, in martial art. Like that's yeah. how I view, I view life through that. Um, and it's one of like, I, I argue it all the time. Like it's one of the best philosophies to go through life is the martial arts philosophy because it's one of discipline. Yeah. It's one of egolessness. Um, because you, you can you can try to keep your ego in martial arts. It'll be destroyed eventually. You know, <laughs> some person who's <laughs> like a hundred pounds less than you will tap you out and ju- rolling in jujitsu, or you know, land a, uh, a nice a nice punch or a body shot, or there's like all these things that can really humble you within that. And as somebody sure. who, you know, has been doing it for a long time, I've had to deal with a lot of a lot of stuff like that. I deal with all that. I'm glad it had had to happen in the gym rather than anywhere, any other scenario, like on the street or in an mm-hmm. argument with somebody else. And the irony of it, the more you engage in combat willingly in a controlled setting, the less you do it outside of your outside of that. So, you know, like I, mm-hmm. I have rarely get into any fights. I've never got into a street fight ever. You know, like I rarely get into arguments with random people. I always try to deescalate because, you know, First off, you know you can handle yourself, and yeah. you also know that you, like you have the responsibility as the person who can handle themselves that like you could really hurt somebody, um, mm-hmm. and it's almost your responsibility because you have that knowledge. Like for them, ignorance is bliss, right? They feel they just can't see beyond sure. their emotions, but you understand the severity of it. Like if, for example, if you're you you're in that scenario where there wasn't any controls and you weren't in um, a control setting like a gym like somebody wouldn't be getting up after right so Mm -hmm. you have to it really puts things in perspective and makes you realize that you know it's not worth it like in most scenarios Mm -hmm. and that's made me it's helped me like just through life like sure people try to that's got to be 
incredibly helpful um, in your day to day, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, it also like since you started martial arts, I'm assuming your confidence level has has gone way up. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely contributed to that. Um, yeah. Like I remember, nobody really bullied me growing up because I'd always give them a little something to, to let them know, like just like we're we're friends. Like I like to joke around. I'm, I'm like a genuinely. I'm not an argumentative person. I'm a very like yeah. goofy, uh, fun loving guy, but like, you know, don't, don't push it too far, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I was never physically bullied. Like people always just say stuff. Of course, the kids always say stuff, but sure. Um, you know, like I never, I never let, I never put myself in that scenario because you know, bullies target a certain type of person and I never let myself become that person. Um, mm -hmm. and I always, but I always hated those, those kind of people who, who do that, who pick on those or small. I mean, everyone, nobody likes those sure. kind of people, but I just, mm -hmm. cause I, you see those kind of people in the gym sometimes they don't last very long, but I always right. have it out for them because you know, they'll get their just desserts eventually, but sure. You know, I just, I just don't like that. The sort of the ego that comes with, and it's, it, you, you see it a lot with the guys, unfortunately. <laughs> um, sure. And, you know, I think that it's if everyone was able to experience that, like the humbling nature of martial art or even it doesn't right. have to be martial art. You know, you don't have to get punched in the face. If you don't want to, but you can do yeah. some other entering a field where you're not an expert already, you know, like mm -hmm. learning how to swim at like uh, an older age. Sure. Like a lot of people yeah. are too scared or it feels like it feels weird to feel helpless in a scenario. But, you know, putting yourself outside of your comfort zone where you are the beginner, where you all always have it. There's a philosophy in karate. Um, I'm not a I'm not a karate practitioner, but I like to look at our other martial arts and take from their philosophies and apply it to my own life. But just having the white belt mind, you know, like always having a learner's mind mm -hmm. is the best way to to go through life. Like you don't enter another gym wearing a black belt. You know, you always come in with a white belt no matter what what level you are. And of course, like Muay Thai doesn't have belts, but we have the same idea. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, uh, I believe a hundred percent in that. It, it's basically like it could be said is under, you know, um, under promise over deliver kind of thing. Like, we, you know, I, and I really resonate with this egoless um, belief or mindset, which, you know, um, there's always somebody bigger. There's always somebody better. Um, there's always somebody less big and, and, and not quite as good as you. Either. So you, you have to just realize that. And I love that statement of observe versus judgment. Um, that's really what it all comes down to for me is like you know ob observing and i like there's there's design agencies that i'm like fuck man they're amazing like like to, to, you know, i just put them on a pedestal do i think they're probably doing the same with with other companies yes but it's like to me that's the mentality is like okay what what are they doing that i love so much or what you know what is so i'm learning from them but it's really defined to me like you know when i was younger and i had probably more of a chip on my shoulder and it's like i had more to prove i'm like yeah but they're this and they're that and it's like you know that's you know it, it's design such a subjective field right like it's you like blue i don't like it's just so mm -hmm. up in the air like you there's no way you're pleasing everyone um so you do need a bit bit of ego to protect yourself from the subjectivity yeah um but i do think that the fact that it's there is no right or wrong like i just have to keep telling myself there's no right or wrong it's just opinions it's just that kind of thing um but it's it's calmed me down and it's really helped my uh just general anxiety in general where it's like you know, all I cared about, like, let's be the best. We got to be the best, the best. It's like, what is the best? Like, you know, we're a good company. We're working for you know, these great brands. We're doing 
global, like, you know, just take it all in, you know, yes, you can get better, but also appreciate how far you've come and, you know, what you've done. And, um, you know, to me, a lot of what you're talking about of just learning to swim or like putting yourself out there, I just had to do because I have no idea about social media. And yet my job is to, to, to communicate through it. I have to learn it. I'm learning from, you know, basically your generation and, and from uh, the younger designers. And once you get over the fact that I don't fucking know everything, mm-hmm. it becomes really exciting. And that's one of those things that keeps me happy with where I'm at. Um, the, you know, the introduction of AI is another one that's like, Jesus, are we going to have jobs? Like, you know, mm-hmm. that whole thing. And then once you get to know it, it's like, oh, okay, I get, it's, this is incredibly helpful. Like this, and I know how to use it. I know, you know, what to do. And guess what? It's not going away. So, you know, you yeah. better learn and you better um, figure out how it can help you and, um, you know, keep keep your value as a, you know, productive employee up and things like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's the kind of thing that just kept me engaged, right, for for so long. Have you, you know, you mentioned that it's important to have to check your ego, but also have a level of, you know, personal confidence where you don't get, you know, torn down, turned down by people you put up on a pedestal. I often mm-hmm. I, I I would have this issue. I mean, it just imposter syndrome is um, something that I've experienced this, you know, like I, I've always tried to, you know, keep my ego in check, but I've kind of almost gone too far one way where I end up losing, you know, the self-confidence that I built up <laughs> for myself in the long run. Have you ever experienced something like that in, in just yeah. in life in general? Yeah, th- I mean, that's, I mean, quite honestly, through my experience over the years, every single person in the world has imposter syndrome is what I figured out. Like I have it. Yeah. Um, my call, like people that I respect and think have got it all figured out. When I talk to them, they're like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so nervous. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, excuse me. Like you just nailed that. Like, what, mm-hmm. like, Oh, I feel like such a phony. I'm like, they're going to figure me out. This is my last job. Like, I hear that every day. Yeah. Um, so I believe, I mean, my hypothesis is everyone has it in different levels. And all we can do is try and keep that in balance. Like, it's a good thing to, um, because if you don't have it, it means you're not self aware either. Yeah. Like, yeah. you're just going through life. Like, <laughs> you know, everybody loves me. Everything I do is perfect. Like, you have yeah. to be giving yourself some some checks here and there right and um it's like we're fuck man we're all so complex in the way that we you know operate but you know i've you know ego to me is a um defense mechanism uh sometimes it's a it's the acting part that i talked about like Mm -hmm. When I walked into a room, when I walked into in his class, I stood up straighter. I stuck my chest out. I, you know, I, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to talk to these little shits. And, you know, like I had to build myself up yeah, yeah. Uh, because I'm nervous. Uh, like, I'm like, in the back of my head, I'm like, why would they want to listen to me? Like, I'm a fucking designer and they're like MBA students. Like, you know, I, I never went to university. I'm not you know, an academic guy. Um, but like you talk yourself up and you go, no, but I've got experience. I've got, you know, some, you know, life lessons of, you know, I can apply things you know, and I've observed through my career things that work, things that don't. And at the end of the day, it's too late. I'm walking into this class. It's going to happen. So <laughs> you got to figure it I out. I just got to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's 
that's that's definitely um yeah i definitely have to do stuff like that especially when it comes to like with it in in mar in when you're in combat like it's um like phys like a physical thing. it's combat sounds a little intense mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in some sort of sparring scenario like i sound like i'm a fucking sure you know um <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you're in that take it easy Rambo oh, yeah, I know I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in the forest with the green all over my face um, <laughs> but you know when you're in that kind of scenario like especially as somebody who is generally smaller than every person I've sparred against like I've never anytime I spar somebody closer to my weight it's like wow everything works you know but when everyone is bigger than you like you have first off you have to be better like in skill you just mm -hmm. have to be like I'm not trying to big myself up but like i had to be a, had a better movement better technique think smarter like fight smarter because mm -hmm. there's more of a risk you know um sure. if a guy who's 50 pounds heavier than you hits you versus even if they're going 50 percent, their 50 percent is my 75 right so mm -hmm. it's um it, the funny part is it, i've always fought off the back foot but I always, my, my instructor taught me, like, sometimes you have to go for it, no matter what, right? It doesn't matter if the person's 100 pounds more than you. And that's a lot like that scenario. Like, it's against my nature. I'm more of, like, I'm going to observe the scenario, think about the most efficient way to mm -hmm. <laughs> solve it. And not just in, sure. like, in an, uh, like a physical interaction, but, like, in life in general. Like, I, I was always that person who sat back and, like, let me overanalyze the situation before I go into it, but before I go into it. And then sometimes you just gotta you gotta just sh put your guard up and shield through it and push mm -hmm. through it you know and i feel like that's like you know when you're saying you know going to into a scenario where you feel super super nervous and you just gotta kind of push right through it i think you know having martial arts in your back pocket as something like you know what like this is not as bad as getting punched in the face so like i can I, i'm pretty sure i can do this yeah i would uh... I would liken it to like if I if I had your skills and talent, I'd be like, that would be part of my pump up song, and be like, well, at least I know I can kick everyone's ass. Yeah, here, so, it's now yeah. that sounds how bad could it be? Yeah, like that always <laughs> helps my ego too. You know, if it's ever feeling sure. low, I just like if they beat me in basketball, well, I can still kick your ass. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think a lot of that too, like you know, the fighting off the back foot thing too, is it's it's also a you know, like I'm a super easygoing guy. I am not the one who monopolizes the the um, the conversation. I, I, you know, I'm not the, the kind of the guy that takes over the boardroom until I do. And so I think it's like, and what that does is it surprises people and it keeps people. <laughs> engage with me like you know i what i don't want is people to paint a picture of me that says okay he's you know don't worry i can handle him he, he'll just do what i say or like yeah. you know so even when i'm talking to um you know my, my fundamental philosophy or why I, I care about what i do is i genuinely um want to help people right like that's that's what i want to do and that can sometimes come across as like a, a pushover or you know whatever yeah so when i raise my voice when i push back when i say you're wrong there's so much impact to that because nobody expects it no like so it's to me it was like that hey if you're you know 75 percent of the time fighting in defense and then all of a sudden wham you're in offense it's surprising um you know keeps people guessing and i think that's a lot of what i i like to do and again part of it's practicing for me too mm -hmm. it's like can i change the situation can i change somebody's mind can i do this how would i do it is it a calm invite them in is it a you know like confidence and raising my voice is it point at you directly look you in the eye you know what is it that i do to you know get my point across and to change your mind because I want you to go this way instead of that way. So it's all, I mean, I don't know if everybody thinks that way, but I'm like constantly assessing how situations go. Yeah. So like in your world, like if you're, you're sparring with somebody and you're like, 
you kind of do a debrief after go, okay next time i'm going to do this and do that and I, i've learned like i'm doing that with fucking everything we do like in every situation yeah um i've got a couple of meetings coming up this afternoon and i'm like should i go in this way should i just, you know hang back and, and let them do that like you know i'm i'm understanding my audience yeah. right like your opponent i'm giving my best guess as to what i think will be the most effective with them mm-hmm. um i'm sometimes asking others my other colleagues to say i want to do this what do you think um and then i'm just doing it Right? Mm-hmm. And then after the meeting, I'm like, okay, that, that was a colossal failure. I'm going to do it this way next time. Yeah. And you'll find as you do it, it's like there's no failures anymore. It's just, hey, uh, maybe next time we'll do this. Or with when you have enough experience, halfway through the meeting, and you can adapt and just go, no, I'm going to change my tactics. And, because now I have the experience to, to know in real time what to do. Whereas, you know, when you're younger and you're just starting out, you're kind of scripting everything you say. Yeah. You don't know, you don't have the words at, at the ready. You don't think like, it's just harder because you haven't had the experience yet. Yeah. You know, but once you get more experience, you know, you can make those decisions halfway through. But the key for me is to talk to people about it after mm-hmm. to my colleagues and said, I did that because of this or especially people who are trying to learn and grow and find their own voice. It's like, Hey, I know we talked about doing it this way. I made a change halfway through and I did it because of this reason that might've been the wrong thing to do, but that's why I did it. They get more out of that conversation than they do just watching what I did through the meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. You know, I always, I always think it's so funny to just see the like the interactions of different different paths, different ways, you know, like I've likened my martial arts experience to your career, you know, it might seem so different, right? Like punching somebody in the face for, you know, a couple of times a week or and comparing that to, you know, working at a, a design firm. Um, but I think that it just shows you that there's so much there's so much everything flows together like at the end of the day like everything is really connected like i see so many similarities even just between the things i do um mm-hmm. like for example just martial art and music you know especially within jazz jazz a lot a big part about it is improvisation and it's about the interaction between the two um the two musicians and that's literally like it's almost like a physical altercation like a sparring session with somebody you're trying to get better with it's like you take mm-hmm. eight bars i solo then you take eight bars you solo and then we try to like build off of whatever each other's doing just like in a, a playful sparring where it's all about exchange rather than dominance mm-hmm. you know you're not trying to dominate somebody like a fight in a fight you're not trying to have like a fight is like into an argument you know if a, mm-hmm. a sparring a a a sparring session is like a debate. So it's, you're there to eventually try to get somewhere in the end, not trying to win. Well, I guess debates, depending on the scenario you're trying to win, but really you're trying to get mm-hmm. to the bottom of what is the right answer. You know, what is the best way to go about things? And both sides are trying to figure that out rather than sure. one side trying to prove, one side trying to aggressively prove <laughs> their point. Mm-hmm. And... I think, um, yeah, there's a, yeah. there's a couple of things that you said, like that, you know, <clears throat> like, I, I mean, I, I love the fact that you're bringing up martial arts because I, you know, again, I'm learning things and I'm like, I, I love some of the things you're saying, like, you know, observation versus judgment or exchange versus dominance. Like those are, those are simple common phrases that I can work into, you know, just my own you know, mentality of like how I'm going to, like, I can, I can now take that statement to a young, uh, say say a a fresh creative director who thinks they have to win a meeting or whatever. It's like, 
hey, look at it. This is going to be an exchange. Mm -hmm. It is not to be dominant. You know, like I can see how that would work. And so I like, um, you know, I, I wish I knew more, more about martial arts, but I, I do, like I, I take something from this conversation. And the other thing that made me smirk was um, when you said, hey, like, you know, design's not like, a, uh, you know, a fight. Um, but it, one of my colleagues um, has a saying that he uses all the time. And it's like when when you're giving a client an answer that you know they're not going to like, he says, sometimes you just got to take the punch in the face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like that's that's literally what it is. Like we're going in there. We know it's going to be negative, but we got to start somewhere. So yeah. we're going to show them. We're going to tell them why we think that. And we're going to be prepared that they're going to punch us. And <laughs> like they're not going to like it. Yeah. But sometimes you got to do it, right? Uh, hopefully if you prepared them, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I've been in enough where, you know, there's, there's anger and there's raised voices and things like that. And really it just comes down to frustration, right? They're frustrated because they don't have the answer. Yeah. And again, that to me goes way right back to, because nobody's defined the real problem here. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm building just off of that. Is there has there been a, any particular project that you personally have really enjoyed, like in the last or just throughout your career? Is there any specific one that stands out as something? Yeah, it's it's hard uh, one because I'm old, I can't <laughs> remember, and and like and I guess it would change, like whether I was a designer uh, or whether. I was a creative director helping others. Um, I, I think because of where I'm at, it's, I, I can't, I don't, you know, we've done one recently where, you know, it's, it's visually, uh, arresting. It's like, a it's a, a new spice line that came out, um, in the U S and it's, um, it's called uh, flavor maker and, um it's got these really cool little puns um you know like it's a sandwich um it's a sandwich spice so it's you know the title of it's like uh i'm i'm great in bread so it's got all these little <laughs> yeah, puns and nice. there's 15 of them and visually and you know it's exciting i i really didn't have a lot to do with it. i just directed a de you know designer and a team to do it um, so I've had to find my value elsewhere. What I what I loved about it though is when you get a huge company to do something a little out of their wheelhouse, yeah. like when you can convince them to do that, that's where I get like, oh, I feel like I've made a contribution here. Yeah, you know, and now it's doing well, and it, you know, it's growing, and they're, they want to launch more flavors. It's like that's an exciting uh, thing for me. Um, when I was a designer myself, I mean, I, I guess I have a hero complex too. Like I'd like to, to come in when nobody's been able to solve something and I come in and I, I go, well, let's just do it this way and solve it. You know, I still have, I still feel like, um, you know, everybody wants to be the guy that, that you know, say it's a day, I, I think, like, you know, you want to be Rambo. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, like, I think, I think I have that. And, and when I can do that, but in support of others. So like if a, now a designer or a client or somebody is just struggling with something and I can enter the picture and clarify things so that everyone achieves their goals, like that's, that's what's really exciting for me now um, versus physically like doing a task and solving a problem. It's more just like, I'd love to, you know, help somebody else get to where they want to be and, and maybe show them or adjust their thinking a little bit, but, you know, much like what, what we're talking about today. <laughs> I think on that, I've kept you for quite a long time. I don't want to, I don't, don't want to keep you for yeah, yeah. any longer. But um, no, that's good. 
Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming on, coming on, Mark. Um, is, if there's anything you want to, you want to plug for people, um, shout out your, uh, shout out uh, Davis, you know, this is the time. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I mean, you know, the Davis agency is where I work. It's uh, been there quite a while and we, we do some, um, it's amazing work, uh, communicating for the world's biggest brand. So, um, and we do it well. Um, I, I just want to thank you for having me on. This has been, oh, of um, course, of course. you know, again, I told you at the beginning, I'm trying to, you know, cure some anxieties and do some things that I wouldn't have done. But I also believe like I've gotten so much out of this conversation and can see how, you know, the way that you um, approach things can really affect and help how, uh, you know, I approach things. And I, I, I honestly love, um, you know, talking to a different generation and how, you know, the struggles that, that you, you go through and things that are concerning to, to you. And, you know, because that just helps me be a lot more um, valuable in my role um, and effective too. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for, for having me on. No, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming on. It's been a wonderful conversation. You know, I've learned learned a lot um, from your experience and just your general advice. And um, I hope everyone listening has enjoyed this episode. If you want to check out The Way Podcast on different platforms, we're on Spotify, YouTube. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram. Check out my LinkedIn if you want to see um, the featured guests. And yeah, thank you all for listening and we'll see you next time.